In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. St. John the Baptist is one of the greatest saints. St. Benedict, when he went to the top of Monte Cassino, when he uh, expelled the devils who roamed there because it was, they were pagan temples. And paganism, of course, worships the false gods and the gods of the Gentiles, the gods of the pagans, says the Holy Ghost, are devils. And St. Benedict cast out the devils. At one time, the monks were trying to move this huge boulder, and they couldn't move it. The toughest monks had ropes. They had all their strength pushing and heaving, and they couldn't move this boulder. And one of them came to St. Benedict and said, we can't move this rock. It's too big. And St. Benedict came, and he says, look, don't you see the, the devils on there? Three fat devils just sitting there, uh, claiming their territory because there was a pagan temple there on top of Monte Cassino before. So St. Benedict cast out the devil with the sign of the cross, and of course the big monks could move the rock. But St. Benedict made sure to put an altar always to St. John the Baptist, the great patron to monks and desert fathers. So St. John the Baptist is always held up every Advent. Him and Isaiah, those names ring out in Advent. They're powerful uh, truths that they trumpeted to the whole world. And St. John the Baptist is, is very interesting. People already knew something was, was happening because St. Zacharias, his father, uh, was a high priest. He would enter the temple, burnt incense once a year. And the angel appeared to him, and when he came out, he couldn't talk. He was mute, so everybody knew something was going on. And as we know from the Holy Scriptures, uh, because St. Luke sat with the Virgin Mary and wrote down all these accounts that are written in the first chapters of St. Luke. And St. Zacharias when he saw the angel, the angel told him, you will have a child. And his, you know, his wife was in her old age, and he doubted. And as a, as a kind of punishment, he was, he was unable to speak, he was mute. So all this went out, and then when St. John the Baptist was finally born, uh, St. Zachary wrote down his name. His name is John. And after that, he was miraculously able to speak again. So everybody knew all the gossip of the town and the whole region was something's going on here. There's a hand of God here. And then, uh, of course, you have St. John the Baptist who was conceived in the womb of St. Elizabeth, the cousin of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And she was older. And uh, God's life the union of St. Zachary and his visitation, the Virgin Mary went to visit her cousin Elizabeth because she was expecting. She was, at the time of her, of her uh, delivery was coming. But the Virgin Mary had already, by the power of the Holy Ghost, conceived our Lord Jesus Christ, the living God, in the, in the Ark of the Covenant, which is the Virgin Mary. So we have that great account in, in the Holy Gospel of the, the joy of St. John the Baptist when by the Holy Ghost, and even in the womb of his mother, he was dancing with joy. And he received by the power and the grace of the approach of the Virgin Mary, most pure, and our Lord Jesus Christ, he received, as the fathers of the church say, he received his baptism at that point. He received the state of St. Divine Grace in the womb of St. Elizabeth. And St. Elizabeth, filled with the Holy Ghost, she said those great words, <clears throat> which is chanted at Vespers every day, the Magnificat, where the Virgin Mary says, My soul magnifies the Lord. I am nothing, but all I do is given to God, and let him do with me what he wills. 
So St. John the Baptist, like David of the Old Testament, danced before the new ark of the covenant. The new covenant, which is Jesus Christ, the King, the living God, the priest and victim, carried in the womb of the Virgin Mary. So St. John the Baptist, uh, in the miraculous recovery of speech for St. Zachary, and all these events, people were, they knew something was going on. And then you had, of course, the Magi and the Star of Bethlehem. And the gossip was, you know, all the mothers of the time were kind of expecting to, and hoping to be the mother of the, of the Messiah. <coughs> so these events are recorded. St. John the Baptist would grow up, would be born and uh, grow up, and as a young man go into the desert for 40 years and doing prayer and penance. He's like, he follows the line of the great prophets, Elias, fasting and prayer, eating, eating uh, grasshoppers, little chocolate-covered grasshoppers in those days. And he ate honey and fasted much, prayed much, he wore camel skin. He was really the image of these rustic church fathers. And St. John the Baptist, when Jesus Christ, the King, began his public life, uh, St. John the Baptist was baptizing and preaching penance, pre preaching to everybody, prepare for the Messiah, prepare for the living God, because he's come, he's here. And <clears throat> one day, our Lord came down to the river. The crowds of people didn't notice anything different. Our Lord went into the river. St. John the Baptist, knowing his cousin, knowing this was our Lord, he said, you know the conversation, you should baptize me, Lord, and I'm not worthy to baptize you. And Christ said, let it be done according to the will of the Father. And when St. John the Baptist, Baptist poured the water over him, of course, St. Thomas Aquinas makes it very clear. Jesus Christ had no sin. He had no sin to wash away. He's God. So why did he accept to be baptized? St. Thomas Aquinas, quoting the fathers of the church, says, because Jesus Christ being all pure, all holy, God himself, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, he's sanctified when the water is poured over him, he sanctified all the waters of the rivers and the oceans of the whole world that would be used for our baptism. So at that moment, you have the incredible sight. The dove came down from heaven, rested over the head of Jesus Christ, and the voice of the Father, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased hear him. And that voice you know, echo, echoed and thundered like a piercing organ throughout the whole region. Everybody heard it. And that will not be the only time the voice of the Father is heard to, to confirm from above the, the role and the mission of his divine Son. So St. John the Baptist uh, witnessed right there the Blessed Trinity. Everybody witnessed the, the Blessed Trinity. The Father and the voice, the Holy Ghost in the appearance of the dove, and the Son, God the Son with the human nature on the earth. And his mission was finally, his mission was the cross. That was the great mission of our Lord. The greatest prayer was to die on the cross to offer the, his own life for our redemption. So, <clears throat> St. John the Baptist is a great, interesting character for us, especially in these days, uh, because he will point out, like at the Mass, when the priest turns around and says, Ecce on your day, he holds before all the world the living God in the host. And we're on our knees, you're on, our, on your knees, adoring our Lord Jesus Christ. We adore Jesus Christ in the Holy Eucharist. That is specifically Catholic. 
That is the joy of Catholics, of tradition, and of all time. That our God loves us so much. The heart of Jesus is so real. His love is so extreme that he gives himself in the Holy Eucharist. And we adore him and we long to receive him. And he, he longs to be united to us. My delights are to be with the children of men. He wants to sanctify our souls. He wants to unite us with himself, that we live in his friendship, live in his grace. This is what it means to live the Catholic life. The spiritual life is to, it's very simple. <clears throat> the Holy Trinity lives in the soul, as your guest, as your friend, to live with you, to fight with you, to sanctify everything you do. So nothing is boring for a Catholic. Nothing's boring. All that you do, whether you eat or play or work or sweat or milk cows or shovel snow, do dishes, hammer nails, mix concrete, <clears throat> nothing's boring because everything becomes holy, everything becomes sanctified. And that's why the monastic life and St. Benedict uh, loved St. John the Baptist because they show the daily routine, the the humdrum things, the boring things that the modern world so quickly wants to discord. For example, the mother at home doing dishes, taking care of the children. There is no more glorious career other than a nun for a woman. Other than a consecrated virgin, there is nothing more glorious than a mother doing her duties at home. Because the Virgin Mary, the, the woman of all women, the model of all women did that very thing. So don't be poisoned with the idea, although in certain circumstances you don't have a choice, that the mother should be at home. And how the modern world hates this. Oh, the, the feminists can't stand this. They can't stand that. But you good mothers, that, you know, Cardinal Mazzenti praised motherhood. So, St. John the Baptist, when he was at the banks of the river, when Jesus Christ had come through, said there was a time, at that time, remember, the apostles were following St. John the Baptist. St. James, St. John, St. Peter. They knew about St. John the Baptist. They really loved St. John the Baptist. They wanted to hear him. They wanted to, and he was telling them, the Messiah is here. He's coming. He's on the earth. So, after a time, the, be the beginning of the public life of our Lord, uh, St. John and St. James were there. And St. John the Baptist points him out, Etchia in his day. There he is. And St. John records this, how he, they went and followed our Lord. And they walked up to our Lord and He's, our Lord is heading to the desert to begin the 40-day fast. And he turns to the two apostles, and they're a little nervous. They, they kick the ground. They don't know quite what to say. Rabbi, where do you live? He says, come and see. And that began their vocation. And these apostles would uh, eventually, our Lord would gather the twelve, and he would start revealing his divinity by the great miracles. And the miracles were so numerous, he emptied out the hospitals, he emptied out the nursing homes. The cures were unbelievable, every town he went to. So St. John the Baptist pointed him out, Etchian is day. And the Mass does this. The Mass points him out every time the priest says, Etchian is day. And you say the words of the Gospel. Domine non sentidus. I am not worthy, Lord, that thou enter under my roof. <coughs> now, St. John the Baptist was very imprudent. The liberal Catholics would call him the model of imprudence. Because he made waves. He shook the boat. He did something that made everybody feel very uncomfortable which was to publicly denounce Herod for his public adultery, his public sin. Because Herod was starting to live with 
the wife of his brother Philip. And it was a public scandal, and everybody knew it. Nobody was daring to say anything because they'd be arrested, they'd be silenced, they'd be punished. St. John the Baptist came out of the desert, and he had enough of it. And he denounced this public sin, this crime. And of course, such imprudence didn't go too well with the higher authorities. And sure enough, St. John the Baptist was arrested. He was in prison. Herod had, a, Herod had a fear of him. He had a great respect for him. And as you know what happens on August 29th, you can read that gospel, the beheading of St. John the Baptist. But before that, the disciples of St. John the Baptist come to St. John the Baptist. They visit him in prison. And they're not sure. They think St. John the Baptist, because he's so great, they think he's the Messiah. And St. John the Baptist always said, I'm not the one. I'm nothing. I'm only the voice. But the bridegroom is with you. So the disciples, as the fathers of the church, tell us, St. John the Baptist, he had no doubt that Christ was the, was the Messiah. He had no doubt in his mind. But the disciples of St. John the Baptist, they were doubting. They weren't sure. So for their sake, St. John the Baptist says, go, uh, go ask. Ask our Lord. Go ask Him. Are you the one that's to come? Or do we wait for another? And Jesus Christ answers to the disciples with, with, with his actions and all the list of miracles that he records. The blind see, the rain walk, the lepers cleanse. Nobody has seen this since, the, since Adam and Eve, these miracles. So, and our Lord doesn't record some of the most astounding miracles, which is to raise three people from the dead, including later himself. So, in other words, Christ was saying, by the works you see, the Messiah is Jesus Christ himself. He is the true God. So, St. John the Baptist strengthens their faith. They, they meet our Lord. And St. John the Baptist, when he's dead, he wants his disciples to go with our Lord Jesus Christ. And they will become his disciples later. Now, St. John the Baptist, of course, is beheaded. And he is one of the first martyrs for our Lord Jesus Christ. He's the last of the Old Testament prophets. Now we can draw a very similar comparison to modern times. The modern times, the men of the Catholic Church wanted to perform an adultery, to marry the spotless bride of our Lord Jesus Christ, of Catholic tradition, the Holy Roman Catholic Church, the only church founded by our Lord Jesus Christ. There is no other, and there is no salvation outside of our Lord Jesus Christ and of His Catholic, Holy Roman Catholic Church. And the Holy Roman Catholic Church has been a rough ride, a history of persecutions, a history of attacks from heresies, emperors, from heretics, from within, from without. The St. Pius X said, never before have we seen an onslaught like this one, modernism, which cuts, takes the axe to the very root of the Catholic faith, which is the faith itself being chopped to pieces by all these works of the modern philosophers and uh, theologians, Teilhard de, Father Teilhard de Chardin, condemned six times by Pius XII, his works, in Loisy. And Pius X hammered the, the heretics, hammered modernism, and warned, Pius XII warned, he saw that the, the bishops were not ready for a council. When he died, John XXIII, the Pope of the time, began the council. And he began it saying, began it saying, uh, we've heard enough of these prophets of doom, always forecasting disaster. We've heard enough of all this gloom and doom, let's open the windows and let some fresh air in. Now, who were the prophets of doom? 
Who foretold fire will come down from heaven? Who foretold Russia will spread her errors throughout the whole world and be gripped in atheism? And the good will be martyred, the Holy Father will suffer much. Who foretold the Antichrist? Who foretold the World War I, World War II, World War III? Who foretold the darkness in the church at the end of the 20th century? Who was a prophet of doom? The Virgin Mary. She warned all these things. She's our mother. She's warned us. And John the 23rd, he said, we've heard enough of these prophets of doom, always forecasting disaster. And they wanted to start a man-made solution to the world's problems, a kind of united nations within the church. And that was the efforts of Vatican II. It was the hijacking, as Archbishop Lefebvre saw, the enemies of the Christ, the liberals took over, hijacked the council, and it was totally directed in a, in a terrible direction. It was the triumph, as Cardinal Ratzinger, Pope Benedict XVI himself said, it was the triumph of the principles of the French Revolution within the church. In other words, it was the triumph of, of, of man-made God Man made into a God to be adored in place of God being adored by man and adoring the God made man on the cross. And that was the triumph of Satan within the church. And this marriage of the Catholic religion with the false ideas condemned by all the popes, this adultery, as, as Archbishop Lefebvre himself called it, and Archbishop of Hesse spoke out against this adultery. He spoke out against it at the council itself. He intervened. And then after the council, he saw the disaster of Vatican II. And when he saw they were trying to corrupt and overthrow by the Argonia Menta, overthrow the religious orders, especially the Holy Ghost Fathers that he was Superior General of. This was the largest missionary order in the whole world. And he resigned because he said, I cannot participate in the destruction of this religious order. And later he saw, I cannot participate in the destruction of the whole Catholic faith. So God raised up Archbishop Lefebvre. And he's not just another prelate. He's just not a another bishop. He was foretold by the Blessed Virgin Mary in 1630s by the Virgin Mary of Quito in Ecuador. She foretold a prelate who would rise up at the end of the 20th century to preserve the Catholic priesthood. And, our, and Archbishop Lefebvre himself referred to this humbly and discreetly at the consecration sermon in 1988. So the Archbishop had that grace of the Holy Ghost, loved by the Virgin Mary and her divine son, to speak out, like St. John the Baptist, against this false adultery. And he continued to do it all his life, up till his death. And, of course, like St. John the Baptist, he was exiled, suspended. He was imprisoned and beheaded by the false excommunications. But that, did that stop him? No, because he, he understood clearly the, the battle at hand. And he himself referred to this marriage, this, uh, this false marriage, this adultery between Catholic Church and the Revolution. He referred to it himself, he said, we've got to stay away from it. Stay away from Vatican II. And he warned us priests in the book, The Spiritual Journey, which is like his last testament. He said, if you want to preserve your priesthood, Stay clear, far away from Vatican II. It will, it will undermine your faith. You will lose your faith. And he said, you will contract spiritual AIDS. AIDS is a disease that God punishes the sins of impurity with, in many cases. And he says, we will contract spiritual AIDS. If we play with the new Mass, Play with Vatican II, play with the new catechism, play with all the new theology and new philosophy 
and all the, even the new luminous mysteries and the new this and the new that, everything has been new. And it's the smoke of Satan within the church. And the Archbishop resisted this. But now, now we see something strange happening within our dear society of St. Pius X. And this is something none of us expected. I didn't. But we are starting to see from the leadership a whole new approach. They are saying now, uh, we got to come under Rome, we got to make an agreement with Rome because we might be in danger of being, becoming schismatics. Because the children are growing up not being under the Pope and uh, they might think, you know, just get used to being not under the Pope. So, they, so the mind of the leadership is saying, well, we got to come under Rome because we got to avoid this. But if we teach our children the catechism, they should know it's normal, yes, to be under the Pope. But what if the Pope doesn't have the faith? What if the Pope is destroying the faith? What if the Pope is holding up world religions of all sorts and gathering to pray for peace? Even if they're together to pray. It's a, it's, a, it's a trampling of the first commandment. And we cannot, Archbishop Lefebvre said, we cannot put ourselves under obedience to those who will destroy the faith. That's a false obedience. And the Archbishop said Satan's masterstroke was to destroy obedience to all of Catholic tradition through a false obedience. And why did so many priests lose their faith? Why did so many nuns abandon the convents and monasteries, abandon their monasteries and their vows? Because of a false obedience. Well, we got to obey Vatican II. We've got to obey the local bishop. We've got to obey the new mass because the Pope wants it. And Archbishop Lefebvre thanked the good Lord. He stood up and said, no way. We want to stay Catholic. We will not go with this. And that's what we have to do today. When we see this move towards Rome from the leadership of the society, we all must stand up and say, no way. Because Rome doesn't have the faith. If we come under Rome, we will be subjected to the modernists. And, you, and do you think, as the first condition, desirable condition says, that we will put ourselves under the local diocesan bishop? Do you think the local diocesan bishop is gonna, is gonna bless the work of tradition? Are they gonna want to see the growth of Catholic schools, seminaries, convents? Are you kidding? These bishops don't even have the faith. Even the, every diocese has, a, has a clown masses and ridiculous masses going on today. And worse things, which for the sake of children I'm not even gonna bring up, but worse things. Parishes uh, given to perverts with pervert priests praising their vice. And these bishops are leading many souls to hell. And how is it possible, even possible, thinkable, that we could desire to put ourselves under these bishops? And that's one of the conditions. And it has not been changed. Don't believe it when they tell you the agreement's off. You can believe it when those conditions are gone, the six conditions. They're flimsy and they're terrible. And when that general chapter statement is changed back to what it was, that no agreement unless there's a doctrinal agreement and the conversion of Rome first, there cannot be a practical agreement just uh, on a canonical level. What else are they saying? They're saying there's a new attitude in Rome. Rome is coming more traditional. This pope wants tradition. <coughs> and one of the priests, the founder of the Good Shepherd Institute in 2006, he himself said, this new pope is traditional. And he made an agreement with Rome, Father Lagari, the Good Shepherd Institute. And they were promised, yeah, you can have the Latin Mass. They were promised as a condition, yeah, you can preach and criticize Vatican II, no problem. And what happened? This year, 
Rome said to the Good Shepherd Institute, you got to start teaching Vatican II in your seminary. you got to start accepting the new catechism. you got to start working with the local bishop and be open to the new mass, the ordinary mass of the Catholic Church, the conciliar church. So Rome, the modernists, are slick. They are deadly, they are slippery, they are wolves in sheep's clothing, and they work intelligently. And, and, and this Pope himself, with all respect to the papacy, which is from Christ, but he will answer before Christ. But he himself said, we have succeeded to bring traditional groups to abandon their rigid position and accept Vatican II. That happened at the Good Shepherd Institute, La Baru. Uh, the Redemptorists came under the local bishop just this August 15th of this year. They were put under the local bishop. And now they've got tape over their mouths, they're in a straitjacket, and they cannot preach against anything of modernism anymore. Maybe in their little sacristy, but that's about it. Remember they had that Catholic newspaper all over the world. They were doing great work until they compromise with Rome. So this is very serious because it's our faith that's at stake, dear faithful. This is why it's so important. This is why you dads need to resist, need, need to sanctify your home. You need to clear, clearly teach the true doctrine to your children and your wives. And go back, read Archbishop Lefebvre. Read him, it's very clear. Read the poems, study. And go ahead, look at Dietschy website. Look at the SSPX website. Do you find any criticism of Vatican II? Do you find Archbishop Lefebvre being quoted extensively in this 50th year of the worst disaster in the history of the church, Vatican II? Nothing. Silence. Why is this happening? Because they want the agreement. What else do we see? We see. Uh, the, the leadership saying, we have to help the Pope restore the church. Now that's great if you have a, a Pope like St. Pius X. Do we have a Pope Pius X on the, on the throne? Far from it. And when he makes moves towards tradition, it is not a conversion because of Sisi, the visits to the synagogues, the praying of the Muslims, <clears throat> accepting the Anglicans without having them renounce the heresies. He is not converted. He is not traditional. But we have to pray for that. But to, to pretend that we have to help the Pope come in to help restore the church is, as Archbishop Lefebvre said, because people said that to him, why don't you get inside the church, be regularized, be recognized, and you'll convert everybody. And the Archbishop just shook his head, his head and said, that is total illusion total illusion. He says that will not happen. If we put ourselves under Rome, we will be pressured, we will be swamped, and we will rot. And we also said we'll be silenced, he said. We'll be silenced. From the inside. We can get inside the church and work from the inside instead of being outside the church. Well, let's make something very clear, dear faithful. Because the Archbishop was very clear. There are two magisteria right now. There is not one magisterium. We are not outside the church and outside the Pope and we kind of come back in. That's not the picture. But that's what's being said. The real picture is what Archbishop Lefebvre said. There is the Holy Roman Catholic Church, those faithful to tradition, they are the visible church. They are the church one, Holy Roman Apostolic. And St. Athanasius, what did he say? Even if Catholics are reduced to a handful and they're faithful to tradition, they remain the true Church of Jesus Christ. But what are we hearing now? We're hearing that we're outside the church and we've got to come back in. We're abnormal, as Father Pfluger said. We're in an abnormal position. And it's true, the crisis is abnormal. But us keeping the faith in the mass, that's not abnormal. We're doing what our fathers did. But we must oppose the 
the, the false magisterium, the liberal, modernist, conciliar church. That we must oppose to save our faith. We cannot go along with it. We cannot put ourselves under that. We stay Roman Catholic. And the Archbishop kept the distinction of the conciliar church and the Roman Catholic church. And he says, as long as the Pope and the bishops and the priests adhere to Vatican II and the conciliar reforms, they abandon. They're the ones in schism against the Catholic Church. They're the ones that abandon the faith of all time and the mass of all time. And he told us, Archbishop of Feb, you stay the true Roman Catholics of all time, faithful to the faith of the popes of all time of the saints, of the councils of the church. And not Vatican II, which is a phony pastoral council. And someday by a saint pope will be condemned. But in the meantime, it's taking many, many priests to hell and bishops. So, dear faithful, uh, let me remind you from the, this is the letter of the three bishops to Bishop Fillet. And remember, Archbishop Lefebvre wrote a letter to all the four bishops in 1988. He told them, be united. But he said, he made it very clear, be united in the faith. And the three bishops, earlier this year, they wrote to Bishop Fillet, appealing to him as Superior General, and they told him, this is a dangerous direction, don't go this way. If you go this direction, it's going to cause division. It's going to cause confusion. And look at the fruits. Bishop Tissier he himself said the Immaculate Heart of Mary cannot bless this step towards the agreement. It does not come from God. And here's why. Archbishop Lefebvre, he spoke out against the council, and in his, in his older age he saw even though he signed a few documents of Vatican II, and this is what even many good priests that I know are now saying, what's wrong with Vatican II? Because Archbishop Lefebvre signed a few documents. It's not all bad. After all, Bishop Fillet said in 2001, it's 95% acceptable. But Archbishop Lefebvre, he warned us, and in his older age, like a last testament to us, his children, and his spiritual sons and daughters, he said the whole thing is poison. The whole council is poison, it's perverse, stay away from it. And here's the quote that the three bishops gave to Bishop Fillet. Here's the quote. It's very short, but very solid. Archbishop Lefebvre says, the more one analyzes the documents of the Vatican Council II, and their interpretation by the authorities of the church. And the more one realizes that they are neither superficial errors, nor a few particular errors, such as ecumenism, religious liberty, and collegial structure, but rather, he says, it's a total perversion of the spirit, a whole new philosophy founded upon subjectivism. And then he says, it is very serious, a total perversion. That is really alarming. And that's the founder of the St. Pius X Society, and the one foretold by the Blessed Virgin Mary. And so his role, our role, is to, to follow his clear guide. Because all Archbishop Lefebvre did was stand on the popes of Pius IX, Pius X, Pius XI. He stood on their shoulders. He echoed all their teaching. And if the society is now wants to go with Rome, we must really pray. We must resist this. We must beg the Virgin Mary, either convert Bishop Fillet so he does a U-turn, or inspire many bishops and priests to come up to resist. But no one can make you lose your Catholic faith. And we must fight for it. So let's turn to St. John the Baptist. Pray to him in this Holy Mass to give us the clear doctrine, to give us a clear love of the Catholic truth, a love of the Catholic faith, the love of Jesus Christ crucified. And through the Immaculate Heart of Mary, keep us faithful so that we 
keep the faith, die in the faith, and obtain the joys of heaven, which I wish you all through her immaculate heart. O Mary, conceive without sin. O Mary, conceive without sin. O Mary, conceive without sin. Pray for us to have the Holy Ghost.